it's now at a point where sure we're still like you have more and more and more and more people piling up at the bottom um and i'm at the point now and i think many are where it needs to be fundamentally shifted and so you can't you can't tweak on the margins you can't change from the inside it has to be fundamental and that's what always drew me to universal basic income it drove me to cash payments that sort of um, cash relief those of us who are really really believe in in cash see it for all of those reasons see it for people's ability to really be who they're meant to be i mean it's not going to solve every issue but certainly it can solve for you know being able to say i don't have to worry whether i'm going to eat next week you know, I don't have to worry if I have to juggle between trying to keep the lights on and figuring out how to take care of the needs of my child. So, yeah, I think that it's 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 providing us with an opportunity to reimagine um, a broken, really, you know, broken systems that have been in play for for decades. Welcome back to Yang Speaks, special Thursday episode as usual on the future of. I'm Zach Grauman, your co-host today. And today we're talking about the future of poverty a bit and we've got an incredible woman uh, named Ann Price joining. She's the president of the Insight Center for Community Economic Development. She's based in Oakland. And what I wanted to talk to her about and learn from her is what's happening on the ground when you're talking about poverty and where this is going. So we started this movement around universal basic income and cash relief, and it has taken off, objectively speaking. You've got cities all over the country piloting you, uh, cash relief. You got Chicago, Boston, LA, um, hopefully where I live, New York City eventually. But what does that mean mechanically and what are the other problems that um, this may not solve? And one of the things we talk about, uh, Ann and I talk about is narratives and how mainstream movements and mainstream press narratives and mainstream stories that we've heard, um, like pick yourself up by the bootstraps or things like that, how they shape policy and how they shape what we're trying to affect when it comes to change, particularly around poverty and both good and bad. So it's a fascinating conversation. I learned a lot. I'm confident you will learn a lot. So tune in right now, the future of poverty with Ann Price right here on Yang Speaks. All right, it is my pleasure. I'm so excited. I had to, um, I told her before we started recording that to professionally stalk her as I was, I found her on, a, on an article talking about economic inclusion and, and I think on affordable housing. But I'm honored to welcome the wonderful Ann Price to Yang Speaks in our episodes on the future of. She's the president of the Insight Center for Community Economic Development and I would say from the outside looking in an expert on what many the many ways our economy is broken and actually doing work to fix that which is something I always respect. So Anne, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining. Thanks for having me on, Zach. I'm excited about this conversation. Me too. Um so let's um so I've got it's been fun for me to kind of learn about you, but why don't we start with with you share a little bit about um about your about your background, how you ended up um as president of someone of an org doing great work. I know it's not necessarily a traditional or easy path. So tell us about you. I really grew up watching my parents who really, you know, fought for the most marginalized folks. My mom was a school teacher um, in Milwaukee and had, you know, her kids were really living in abject poverty. And, and my dad did some work on um, housing and working with tenants to ensure they had quality housing. So I really have had all my life this sense of, of social and racial justice. So I, you know, I, I consider myself like an uber generalist. I've worked on so many issues, Medicaid, hunger. I was a child advocate. I worked on community college issues. And I was really drawn to Insight because they were tackling this 
big issue uh, called the racial wealth gap. And I just really wanted to be part of that. So that's how I landed at Insight. We have that in common. My mom was a teacher as well. She taught special ed um, in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, not the, the nicest part of town. She used to tell me, it was like, a, you know, I mean, she's, the, the kids were, were, were in a tough area. And what, what did your mom teach? And I, I love, you see at a young age, you, it instilled in you, you know? Oh, yeah. My mom taught um, kindergarten and first grade. And she was one of the one of the early teachers that taught really young children how to read. You know, she'd get her kids up to first to third grade reading level. So I was like pretty in awe of her because she was uh, she was awesome teacher. Um, I was a little scared of her in the classroom, to be honest. But she uh, <laughs> Wait, did you you took her cl- mom, your mom was your teacher? No, no, no. She would have okay, me okay, come okay. in. She'd have me like, okay, grade, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, like great papers, sit with her while she was teaching on my, you know, when you have one of those teacher conference days. And, and you know, the reality is, is I grew up in the suburbs and she she wanted to really show me, you know, really how different my my education was, my school, which was pristine and beautiful Um and the school that she taught in, which really, you know, had gates at the windows and, um, you know, where, pe- where kids didn't have the resources that I had. So I knew that, you know, she was quietly teaching me about inequality. How did you end up deciding the career path? Well, you know, I, I honestly didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I changed my major in college maybe three or four times, um, landed on economics, and I really liked it. Um, but then realized that to go to graduate school, like this would just be like a ton of math. And so I was like, <laughs> economics is just like math. Um, yeah, you start so, doing derivatives and yes, uh, econometrics. And like, For anyone who's done this, you're like, oh, this, <laughs> isn't, this isn't as fun as it sounds. This is not as fun <laughs> as it actually sounds. So um, I chose policy school instead. I really wanted to solve like a real, real world problems. And you know, I, I wanted to go to New York. Here was this kid from Wisconsin, and I went to school in Virginia. And I wanted to be in a place where I knew these were, all, were significant issues. These were world-class issues. And I wanted to be able to be in the midst of that, like solving problems. And so, you know, I, I, I had a very circuitous route to kind of get to where I was. I, um, you know, just decided to say, I'm going to try policy. And it ended up being... Um, the greatest choice I could make. So I, I majored in public policy, and one of the reasons for me was uh, I love the concept of the decisions of very few impacting the lives of many. There was something in me like, who's making that decision, and are they qualified? Um, and the big example of me was NAFTA. Um, so for those of you who are not policy wonks or had to sit through courses listening to this, so the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, Basically, the long and short, you probably know more, just much about, or more about this than I do, man. But uh, basically, US auto companies specifically were getting crushed by Honda and Toyota. They're making better cars, to be honest. Um, and so we freak out. We're like, okay, we're going to lower taxes between Mexico and Canada, um, which basically is like raising taxes on Japan, where they're making these great cars. But what the, which in some ways great for our US car companies at that time was our bread and butter when Bill Clinton was president in the 90s. But what did it do? We subsidized, there were other externalities, if you will. And one of the biggest ones is that we subsidize our food in the United States. Um, so we were providing farmers massive subsidies to make their corn cheaper, whatever they're making. And so because of that, we had no taxes in Mexico. There was no, it was free trade with Mexico. So we flooded their market. Um, and Mexico is like 50% small farmer economy. So their farms get wiped out. And then we have an immigration challenge in the United States um, where they start fleeing the United States. And so it was like this mind blowing, who made that decision? Why didn't they think about it? Who's at the table? Were there things when you were studying that was like the, oh yeah, I need to be, I need to be there making the decision because these idiots, whoever it was, um, <laughs> like aren't, aren't, gonna, aren't gonna know what I see. Like what, what do, you, was, do you have that kind of thing? Well, you know, there's there's so many issues. When I um, went to New York, I thought I wanted to study housing, and um, I knew that's where I wanted to go. And then I I realized I didn't want to do that. You know, it's I mean, housing is really complex. It's it's an important issue, of course, but you know, I really wanted to dig in more on the social safety net, and um, you know, saw a range of different different issues, problems at that time. I mean, I was in New York in the midst of 
um, you know, the crack epidemic in the midst of the AIDS crisis, right? And there were, um, you know, a number of, of issues that touched families. So, yeah, I mean, I, I really thought, wow, let me dig in on the social safety net because I thought it would be, it's such a big challenge. So I love big challenges. I think that's what um, you and I and Andrew definitely have in, in, in common in that. Um, and the social safety net was one of the reasons Andrew wrote his book and eventually ran for president is that we are, we're just behind. Let's dive into the Insight Center. What drew you there and, and what, what type of work are you guys doing now? And then I'd love to unpack um, kind of your ideas there too. But let's start with Insight Center. Yeah, you know, we are a women of color led nonprofit and we drive structural and transformative change to build economic inclusion and racial equity, right, for the most marginalized. And so we use a, a unique theory of change and we really strive to shift power and agency in economic policy um, by unapologetically centering those closest to the problems um, and, and, and driving that from the, from the center of those who are most marginalized. And so we do three things, really. We, we do research and advocacy. Um, our research really is in service of campaigns, in service of um, advocacy efforts. We want to do groundbreaking research that really unearths the root causes of problems. Um, we focus on narrative change, and I know that this is big in, in, in the work that we've done around guaranteed income, um, that we really, that, that really narratives are dry, that drive policy, right? We always say that narratives eat policy for lunch, right? So they really shape how we think about problems. So we do a lot of work around narrative change and just thought leadership. We joke that, look, policy is not going to win the elections um, when we were running for president. Although he's like, but one or two big policy ideas, like a vision will. So it's not like, you know, but if you're getting in the weeds on stuff, most people are like, hey, what do you stand for? Um, <laughs> so I'm so curious about the narrative piece of this, because one of the things that was frustrating for us was, um, and I've said this on podcast before. So when we were first running for office, we thought we were going to be the furthest left candidate. Um, because like, I want to give everybody money. Like that's the most progressive idea. You know, can you get more left than that? Like if you're a Republican against handouts, like that's too, too you know, that's like the antithesis. Um, and, but Andrew, um, while being as, as Democrat his whole life was not speaking in maybe the narrative language or um, of some of the people doing, let's call it, either, let's, I think there wasn't a lot of work on guaranteed income, but people doing work on the social safety net, there was a disconnect. And so he was pinged. I mean, we've been called a white nationalist. We've been called uh, like things that are just far, even called Republican, which he's like, hey, this was Dr. King's vision for, you know, in, in his book, Chaos or Community. So uh, like what uh, what are your thoughts on how the narrative kind of shapes policy and in some of the stuff you guys do to counteract that? You know, there's a number of dominant narratives, but, you know, the major the major narrative that uh, we deal with in this country is a personal responsibility narrative. And it, oh, it really bootstraps. says that, and bootstraps, which is, bootstraps. yeah, yes. that the, I call them the two sides of the same coin, right? They're all rooted in the notion that basically the mechanism to success is through your own hard work and grit and self-determination. And, you know, if you're not successful, if you're poor, it's because of your own personal failings. It's something yeah. that you've done wrong, you make bad choices. And, you know, what it really, really calls for is not investing in people, right? Because why should the government um, intervene when it's really everyone's responsibility to um, make sure that they can find their own path to economic, uh, you know, mobility and prosperity? And it's been a really harmful narrative. And it's, it's not innocent at all, right? There's been, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars invested in this narrative, because what it means is that we can, you know, really be, uh, you know, it means that we can be dominated by like corporate culture, right? Corporate concentration. We can dismiss, we can say we need smaller government. We need, um, we, you know, some of our, our government entities should be replaced with private entities like libraries, for example, right? Should be run by private companies. And so it's very damaging. Um, it, it, it also impedes our ability to pass good policy, right? If people believe, look, there's nothing that you can do because basically it's everyone's responsibility to make their own way, then why do we need government intervention? Why do we need government investment, right? And so, you know, when we think about our social safety net, that has been a predominant narrative driving policy. And it's so easy 
to weaponize that narrative. And you can just racialize it. You know, when you start using words like, when you start using words like cheats, when you use words like these people are lazy, they don't want to work. And we see that narrative now with unemployment insurance, right? What's being said, you know what? People aren't going back to, they, you know, this is a disincentive for people to go back to work because inherently we believe that, you know, there are groups of folks that don't want to work. Um, and it's all around deservedness. This is all about who's deserving. And so it's a, it's a major reason why we have such a weak social safety net. The reason we saw that even when um, cash rolled out, um, you know, and people needed unemployment benefits, the systems couldn't handle the numbers because they were designed not to really allow people to get unemployment insurance, right? Um, our welfare system is really meant for people not to get access to it. I mean, it sounds really counterintuitive, but... It's a cycle. It, it's, it's a cycle. Comes, and, and, yes. and mainly the cycle is, it's not that people want to stay on it, and not that we don't have rules to get people off of it. But, you know, when you go out and you get a job and you just make a little bit more that makes you lose your housing, that makes yep. you lose a childcare subsidy. You're actually in worse shape. So why do we have a system that makes you worse off, right? So that's what we have in play. And that's why I think even with cash, the idea that it really is addressing a shortcoming in our social safety net. Um, we see that it's just like when people can make their own decisions, they will buy food, they will pay off debt, they will, um, you know, stash a little bit of money away. Um, we've seen the results from what can happen when we can allow people to make their own choices. And the social safety net is all about controlling people's decisions, constraining them, um, telling them what they can buy and what they can't buy. Um, and it keeps people in a box. It keeps them cemented in place. So yeah, it's one of those, it's a system that remains somewhat hidden. Um, there's been little political will on both, in both parties to actually radically reimagine the system. I just loved everything you just said. And I'm, I'm learning too, which is um, in terms of specific ways you're talking about it. I So AOC said something funny, um, funny and, and painfully true. She said, you know, pulling yourself by the bootstraps doesn't work if you don't have bootstraps at all, right? Um, and there's a story I remember from high school and I, I went to um, a public school um, in Elmwood, right outside of Hartford. And um, so we were, we were a really diverse, pretty big school. And one of my buddies' name was Alex Gonzalez, El Com Gonzo. Um, smart kid, and he was this huge linebacker, but like a teddy bear. I'll never forget one day coming after practice. I always thought I was I was a pretty like I was a hard worker, like most people are. And I um and it was like seven o'clock. We just finished football practice, and I was like, we were leaving, and it's like um going home to start homework, right? You're two, three hours of homework you have every night. And I was like, do you need a ride? He's like, no, no, I'm good. I got to go to work. I'm like, what do you mean you got to go to work? He's like, yeah, I got to go start my shift at Baskin Robbins. Um, I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I, you know, if I want to pay for my cell phone, um, I got to, I got to work. And it was this, now I was a, I was a paper boy. I worked a little and I paid for, you know, certain things like that. But if the, it was the, the jarring moment. Was like, all right, that stuff, if you have less time to do your homework, it's going to hit your GPA, it's going to hurt your extracurriculars, these sort of things. It's just being a small, small slip and it has nothing to do with hard work because he was working his tail off. Um, and it was like one minor example that I'm sure of a billion that you could think of and know off the top of your head. Um, why do you think, you said this, there's been little political will on both sides of the aisle. Um, and that's going to include leaders from every demographic, right? Um, why? I, I really think it comes back to deservedness and who we think is deserving. And we still see poverty as a, a, as a moral failing. You know, we don't see it as a structural issue. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to move the needle when you've been, you've been hearing this narrative you know, I mean, we don't even rec probably recognize how much we hear that narrative about um, who's deserving about people who don't want to work hard. Um, and it's, it's just, it's something that we quietly hear like our whole lives. And so, you know, to break through, it takes, it's, it takes intentionality, right? This isn't going to just happen on its own, right? And people 
then just invest in this narrative for no reason. It has tremendous political gain, right? It means you can deregulate. It means that you can um, lower ta corporate taxes. It means all of these things that actually benefit um, a few. And so it's, like I said, it's, it's in no way innocent. So I think that is why I've seen that in my work, uh, um, you know, both at a, at a city level and at a national level where you have legislators are like, well, what if it means that people aren't going to work or, you know, um, what if they're trying to really scam the system? Because we always think that people are trying to scam the system. I, I remember in New York, I was working on, um, you know, food stamp at the time called food stamp. Now it's called SNAP over payments. And these were like, like, really like glitches, system glitches, where people might get literally five to ten dollars more in their in their um, in their food stamps. And there was a whole unit just, you know, dedicated to fraud. And we found out it cost two hundred and fifty dollars for every dollar you recover, right? It cost two hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> and what the, the major issue was like, it was just like they were small amounts. I'm telling you five to ten dollars typically. Um, and when, you know, I went to a a, a local council person, I said, we've got to stop this. And he's like, I just can't. The narrative behind it is just, you know, what, I'm, I'm stopping cheats. And I'm like, these aren't cheats. You know, like we need a better, maybe you need a better computer system. I don't know. But it is, I think there's just a real pull for us because people can really utilize that, that narrative to talk about people's morality, to talk about um, you know, we don't want people cheating and scamming the system. We don't, we want to make sure people are responsible, um, you know, and, and those things that are really deeply embedded in our psyches, like it's deeply embedded. It doesn't matter your, your, where you live or your political affiliation or, or race. It's, it's something that pretty much Americans believe. No politician wants to be the guy or gal that's like, oh, I'm going to let, I'm going to, we have this fraud prevention department that prevents people from stealing your tax dollars. I'm going to be the person that gets rid of that. Like no one wants to publicly say that, even though they know what you know is like, look, it's super expensive. The ROI is terrible. Um, and, you know, you're just making, frankly, the people who are benefiting from it generally their lives worse. But the big thing for me and where Andrew and I would talk about it a lot, and Andrew's big on this in the trail, if we ever got the chance to speak, was that that should be the cost of doing business in this in this situation because the real expense is having people in poverty because what happens is we nickel and we save the nickel and dimes on the front end but we pay for it 10x on the back end whether it's our housing shelters our health care or you go like that's where the real money where you have a very when you end up with a poor disadvantaged society you, you end up with it's it's more it's even more expensive. You want to make the like the argument that this is a, a cost saving initiative. It's ridiculous. It's a fundamentally ridiculous argument. Um, the economy will do better. You'll have more tax dollars to spend if everybody's participating. Fact. Um, so that's a narrative. It's not there. It needs to be there. So I'm, I'm feeling. I know your frustration. I feel it too. Okay, I, like you, live a very busy, as we all do, very busy, stressful lives. And when you don't have a good mattress to come home to and crash on, it sucks. And I'm grateful that uh, we've partnered with Helix Sleep and I've been using a Helix mattress and sleeping on it and it's amazing. Helix Sleep is awesome and here's how they work. They give you like this two minute sleep quiz. You fill it out based on your preferences. Do you like a softer firm mattress? Do you sleep on your side? Do you turn your neck? Do you sleep hot? Whatever it is and they match you with the perfect mattress. I got this King mattress, get the perfect balance for me. It's the Helix Lux, the California King. It's freaking massive and I love it to death. And it's not just me. Helix was awarded number one best overall mattress pick in 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. Literally the people that rate mattresses for a living pick this number one multiple times. So here's the deal. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang. Take their two minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will get you the best sleep of your life for real. They got a 10 year warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you're going to. Um, and they ship it to you in this beautiful box, comes out, roll it out. Um, super easy, super awesome. So right now they're offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash yang. That's helix, H E L I X, sleep.com slash yang for up to $200 off and two free pillows. Check it out.
what does success look like as you, when you guys work? You know, like how are you, like is there something you can measure towards? Because it's such a big complex problem. What's your piece that you can affect or what, what, is it, what does it look like when you guys get a win? Yeah, I mean, certainly we, there's certain um, legislation that we've worked on where we've seen that be successful in past. Um, we've seen how our research has contributed to, um, you know, policy wins and a greater understanding of, of an issue. So we can certainly see that. You know, um, I think that some of our work at Insight, we really are sometimes um, ahead of where other folks are and, and they're thinking, and when I say ahead, like future thinking, I mean, you know, we'll put an idea out there and initially people will say, wow, that's kind of crazy. So, I mean, for example, we are very much, our work is centered on racial equity. And, you know, we've come to really think that racial equity is also becoming kind of muddied. Like, what does it mean? How do you know you're successful? How do you measure it? And so we really, you know, start to think about a foundational architecture of our economy that's built on anti-blackness, right? Um, and I'll explain that in just a second. But, you know, um, so we really, we developed this, this, this framework that says, you know, we can, we can center blackness in policy, right, to address anti-blackness and really address the most marginalized. Um, and so some people see that as radical, but it's a logical framework to solve for racism embedded in our economy and our politics. And so that's what I mean by kind of pushing the envelope on some of these issues. So when we think about anti-blackness, um, and I call it a foundational architecture because our economy was built on this very notion of anti-black racism. And when we think about how our economy was shaped through slavery, right, that this was not just, you know, the fact that there were some plantations and some, you know, slaves in the South worked on them. This was a, gl a global economy, right? Um, and it it, it really allowed us as a nation to develop like business models from this architecture, right? Uh, you know, how we thought about collateral, how we thought about depreciation, even how we thought about labor and how, how you could actually, yes, and how you could really, um, you know, extract from labor, how you could force labor to be more productive, right? And you know, we can see it today in surveillance and we think about how we can push workers to produce more. Um, so this isn't something that, this is very foundational to our nation's economy, but also to the rules of our economic policies, right? I just talked about the social safety net. And our social safety net is predicated on tropes like a welfare queen uh, narrative. It is, it's, it's even when people say, when you think about poverty, who do you think about, right? And people often say black people, right? Um, and because of that, you know, we have very punitive systems. And so what if we really just thought about um, centering the most marginalized and, and thought about what would, what would it look like in our policy if we can actually solve for anti-blackness? That's a new way of thinking about racial equity. Um, and it, I think it's a very unifying, actually, it's a very, it's a way to build solidarity because we're all impacted by it. Think about this, right? So when you think about Medicaid expansion and the fact that a lot of states chose, have chosen not to expand Medicaid, um, and you listen to the narratives behind that, it's these same kinds of things about deservedness. Who is it hurting? Yes, it can be, it's hurting black people, but it's also hurting white people and maybe even to a greater degree, right? So these, you know, anything that's really predicated on this notion ensnares everyone that's in it. it. Ensnares everyone that has to, that needs that policy, that needs that program, um, you know, to survive, uh, to be able to be, you know, uh, moved up economically, uh, it's 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 really fun. It's something that we don't talk about because it's just so it's so difficult for us to think about our economy in that way. But when we look at a lot of policies, you can go back and see how they're how they're embedded in anti-blackness and why we can't move the needle on certain policies. Thank you for sharing that. And I think a lot of the the bigger challenges. You're right is that it's less on the policy, it's more on the narrative, too, because there are certain sides on the right 
they actually don't want to hear that, um, or it's tough for them to hear that, um, probably because it cuts against the first narrative that they earned their way, right? The current system was successful from a dollars and cents standpoint. Um, you know, we became the wealthiest country in the world, so that's, I think, just the numbers. But um, busted and twisted in, its, in how we got there. Um, and it's now at a point where, sure, we're still, like, you have more and more and more and more people piling up at the bottom. Um, and I'm at the point now, and I think many are, where it needs to be fundamentally shifted. And so you can't, you can't tweak on the margins, you can't change from the inside, it has to be fundamental. And that's what always drew me to universal basic income. It drove me to cash payments, that sort of um, cash relief, because it would fundamentally start, it wouldn't be the only fundamental, but it would start to rewrite the rules of the economy where you basically your income level doesn't start at zero. Um, in your view, um, you guys are based in Oakland, um, which uh, nearby Stockton, California, was the first city to really pilot basic income. On a cash relief standpoint, or if you wanted to start rewriting the fundamental rules, like how would you how would you go about that, right? Let's say, hey, I had the money and I had the political will and skill to execute it. What does that mechanically look like on your end? And then maybe we can back into the narrative that needs to happen to do that. But mechanically on cash relief, what, what are you, how would you envision that from your end? What's really amazing about the pilots that we're seeing is it's, it's helping us really think about how we can design an entire system, right? It's, it's really, um, shredding those myths about what we think cash would do, right? There was just, everyone was geared up to think this is going to, you know, what's going to happen. People are going to go out and not know how to spend the money and this wouldn't, you know, make a difference. But what we're seeing is quite the opposite. And I think, you know, one, living here in, in California, knowing that, you know, wages really just can't keep up with the cost of living, even with high minimum wage, wage laws here, um, that the cost of living is outstripping um, wages, that this, this like pilot of $500 a month made a significant difference in people's lives. I mean, it enabled people to, to actually work more. It enabled people to take care of their families, meaning those who are caretakers. And, and, and we've got to think about the, the, the care infrastructure. I mean, it's, it's critical in, in coming out of this pandemic. Um, it, it helped people, you know, pay down debt. It helped people, which I think is one of the biggest issues. It gave people a greater sense of peace of mind. It helped people deal with the stress and that, and all the things that manifest from stress, from being short on money every month. And so it's teaching us that we can really have a new way of operating in this country if we think about... Um, really moving away from punitive approaches and really helping people get what they need and, and trusting them to say, I know what's really best for my family. I think, you know, even looking at a, the pilot in Jackson, Mississippi with, with black mothers and saying, you know, finally, like, I can take my kid to the ocean. You know, I can get them extra help in school. Um, all of the things that make our lives worth living, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, those, those of us who are really, really believe in, in cash, see it for all of those reasons, see it for people's ability to really be who they're meant to be. I mean, it's not going to solve every issue, but certainly it can solve for, you know, being able to say, I don't have to worry whether I'm going to eat next week. You know, I don't have to worry if I have to juggle between trying to keep the lights on and figuring out how to take care of the needs of my child. So, yeah, I think that it's 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 providing us with an opportunity to reimagine um, a broken, really, you know, broken systems that have been in play for for decades. For us, the press narrative that was so frustrating was that people said Andrew was going to um, get rid of other benefits in addition to cash, and never said that. He said on the on the margins you could opt in, but never ever said, um, and he never would. Like he's like the point. Like if you any anyone ever listens to him, like why is he running? Is to fix it, not to cause more problems. Jeez. Um, and you're right that there's a you're not just fighting a broken political system. You're not just fighting um, even like a status quo or the the 
the work, like sometimes just passing a law or lobbying, whatever it is, is, is straight up work and it's time. Like a lot of stuff we've done on Cash Relief with Humanity Forward before, um, before Andrew and I left was like talking to senators and congresswomen um, and who had never seen data on this stuff. Um, and they're like, oh, thanks, I'm great. I mean, I'm supportive of this. I never knew, right? So there's like, there's work there. But the bigger thing is this narrative story piece. Um, let me ask you this, when you're um, in the nonprofit world, as much as we want to focus on the work all day long, you also have to focus on the money and the dollars and the grants and things like that. From the donor side of things, you know, how often, how much education are you doing on your end to help them understand um, what you're trying to accomplish and what the actual problems are? Or, and then are there mistakes or preconceived notions that you have from big donors coming in to help? Because I always feel like you got the money on one side and the people on the other and people doing the work in between. Um, have you seen that challenge from the money hitting the org? What, what are your, um, you know, how, how have you navigated that as a leader? You know, it's it's still quite a challenge, right? And I think that, you know, I really believe that we need new models, both in our kind of nonprofit industrial complex and the way that um, money is raised through traditional philanthropy. You know, it's, it's um, very difficult to think about innovation um, because once you have to prove that and show that you've done it before people will actually invest, right? And so I feel like we're, we're being stifled a lot on innovation. I mean, when you think about this pilot, think about what this one pilot has done in Stockton um, it, to really build a national movement. Yeah. And LA, it, Chicago. Chi oh, yes, well, Newark, all, all, all across, all across yep. exactly, across the country. I mean, they're just, I hear about more and more pilots every day that are, that are really focused on particular populations or to deal with particular issues. But think about that. That was an innovative approach where, you know, um, Michael Tubbs really said, I really want to address this narrative around poverty. I mean, I know the $500 will help people, but fundamentally, that's really what I want to change. So I think that there is, there are not as many opportunities as there should be to innovate through traditional philanthropy, right? And to do that in a myriad of ways that you could really take an idea out and test it, you know? Um, there's a number of things we'd love to test more and it's very hard to fundraise for that. Risk, it's hard to fundraise for risk. It's hard to fundraise for risk, but when we think about other business models, we do it all the time, right? Oh yeah, football, yeah, we love you know, risk. Right, we love exactly. Risk. We do it every day. We do it every day, and that's how we think about how we're going to actually solve these problems if we don't innovate, right? Um, I think that too, you know, it's it is somewhat of a closed world. Sometimes you just can't get funding. You, you know, they you know you have to know someone who knows someone who knows someone. Of course, that's how the world works, but um, you know. Uh, you know, too often, you know, the money is so niched and it's so, um, you know, very specific that you've got to go in and you've got to find that niche. There's not a lot of investment to say, look, we're going to just provide you with some core support so you can work on all of these things that you're doing here at the Insight Center. I think some more funders are coming around to that, but I think there needs to be a bigger push in that way if we're going to actually be able to move the needle. So we, we, we actually still need better, better models. I think that, you know, our work, we're small, and we really are just really focused on digging into root causes of issues. And not everyone wants to fund that, right? Um, and, and so, but we feel like that's big, important work, and we're going to continue to do it and continue to push the, push the field and, and push on funders and to say these things. Because, you know, clearly if you're working on issues around gender and race, you know, these are very challenging issues. And it's going to take more than just traditional kinds of approaches to get us to a place we need to be, you know. Um, we've, we've got a big issue coming out of this, out of this um, recession, out of this pandemic, and that's why there have been 2.3 million women pushed out of the labor market. Um, it's, it's, it's having a monumental effect on families and everyone that, that's, you know, sitting and, and seeing um, partners, wives, friends, mothers, um, daughters, you know, deal with home schooling and um, working and making, having to make difficult choices. What are we going to do to rebuild our care infrastructure or to really reimagine what, Reimagine it because it actually needs uh, a lot more than what it had prior to the pandemic. 
So these are things that I think, you know, I'd love to see more innovation. I'd love to see more trust, you know, trust to deliver, just like we're talking about trusting families to make decisions. Of course. Um, so, yeah, you know, there's, there's still room, room uh, there, a lot of work to do. A lot of work <laughs> oh, to do there. Yes. Lot, so I, I used to work in client philanthropy, and the biggest thing I would tell clients is the world needs donors to take risk to be okay with lighting a gift on fire in terms of failing, be okay with failure because whether we like it, because a lot of people want to have their legacy, they want to say they help, they want to feel good, but the reality is that's the job of private philanthropy. That's the job um, because the government or big organizations like churches, or you go down a list of organizations that can give at scale, if you will, um, but it's mainly the government, they can't take risk. Because look, I mean, the Michael Tubbs, like he took an awesome risk, great, booted out, um, didn't win the next election. Like that's what happens when you take risks as politician. Um, and now to be fair, I don't know enough about that situation to know why, but re re regardless, that is a normal thing in politics. And that's where private philanthropists need to, to give the risk and fund either general, general money for nonprofits and, and um, program officers to do work or I'm going to fund some research. I'm going to fund a pilot program and it may fail, but that is our job to fail, right? It is our job. It's the only way we're going to learn. Yeah. So, and I wouldn't even say it's failure. You know, I mean, I, I it's, yeah, you're it's, right. it's, you're it's right. the lessons it's, learned to say, well, well, you know what? Um, you know, maybe this wasn't the right population we need, you know, we should be working with this population. Right. I mean, I, I did that with a, a middle school program where we were doing an intervention and we realized, no, it, th these kids had to have, this, this, and that, right? So we just need to kind of re-gear our program for a different set of kids. And that's the case. So we learn from these things and then we can actually continue to innovate. So yeah, we need that investment. We've got to, we've got to, and I think that, you know, people who are pushing this forward, it's not coming out of nowhere. It's coming out of years of working with folks, coming out of years of experience, and it's really trying to put good ideas to the test. Um, so yeah, definitely. Yeah, some of it's not going to maybe have uh, the success we may have wanted, but it might show us a better way to kind of get it done. Absolutely. And um, it's the, the, I don't know if it's true or not that he said it, but I, be, I believe it's true. Is it what Edison said when he made the light bulb? He said, I didn't, you know, he, it took him a thousand times. He said, I didn't fail a thousand times. I found a thousand, a thousand ways to not make a light bulb. And those were always helpful learnings. Um, it wasn't not gonna be this one. And that's like, we, we need to have that sort of, this hopeful optimism with our giving um, and spirit of entrepreneurship with our, in our social programs. It's one of the things I love about Andrew. He has, he's so freaking hopeful and abundant and we need that. If you had infinity, all the money in the world, um, how would you spend it to solve um, a, a number of the issues you're talking about. Now, you may want to not do all of them, but maybe where would you spend the unlimited resources um, to fight what you're fighting? I'd focus this on women, <laughs> and I focus it on women of color specifically. And you know why? It's because, honestly, if those groups are doing well, then everyone's doing well. We continuously leave folks leaves folks out, right? And we're constantly solving for that, or trying to. Um, and then we, and we look at our policies and say, oh wait, this group has been left behind, right? But you know, there's never been a time where black women have been doing well, well never. And if they were, everyone else also wasn't doing well. So when I say center our work and our resources and policies on the most marginalized, it's to really ensure that everyone can thrive. And it's, it's a framework to say, we know if those folks are thriving, we have probably designed policies and systems that work for everyone. So I, that's really what I want to get at. I, wanna, I want to, to be able to have these systems work for everyone. When we think about lifetime earnings that are being left because of pay inequities, and we think about, when we think about that, like, it really means that we could be more prosperous, both as communities and as a nation, that we're just leaving money behind and really all the problems that come along with it, whether those are health issues or other things. So yeah, that's what I would do, definitely. <laughs> I love that answer. Um, I saw Tom Brokaw speak at an event a while back and he said something really that stuck with me. He said, uh, I'm optim this is probably five years back, maybe six years back. And he said, I'm optimistic on the future of this country. And he's like, for one word, women 
because we've had this much success in the United States with half our population participating. Um, and to your point, like women of color and in, um, even more so if that's what you're talking about. So um, I met with a, um, there was a very, very, very senior woman um, who had worked at the um, UN and World Bank, like with the players, to put it this way. That's all I, I don't want to give away because at a certain point there's proclamation to find out who she is. But she had asked that question to a table of our, our clients at the bank and then Everybody said, no, I spent on education, I spent on this, spent on what, you know, their, their cause of choice, if you will. And then I was like, well, what? And then I put it back on her. I was like, well, what would you spend it on? Um, and she, you know, she said, she said, I would use the money to bribe elected officials and people in power, um, which is a fascinating, like mind blowing, <laughs> like, whoa, um, because like they'll actually do it if they get paid. Um, <laughs> and maybe that's it. But given the fact that um, we are not, you know, that's a, it's, it's obviously an exercise. What we, to your point, like the narrative and the flow, and one of the things I love about Andrew, like that's what that's where we need to spend the the, the money and, and energy and time because I, one of the things that Andrew, when he was fighting for cash relief, and then the coronavirus hit, what happened when that hit? Mitt Romney, the Pope, Donald Trump. You had people across the political spectrum saying, "Oh yeah, cash relief's a good idea," and it's you know okay. Um, and when the narrative changes, the party lines move, right? Um, and the greed moves, right? So, um, I very much agree um, with with the work you're doing. And frankly, the way to change narratives many times is like get people better data, get people better numbers, um, show them the incentives on both sides. Um, and that requires fighting. That requires like doing the research, grinding it out, getting it right, getting the right story, and then pounding the pavement to go tell the people, the officials, the messages, the ads, whatever it is. So, th- I mean, the work you're doing is 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 meant in many ways like real life superhero work. You know, what's exciting you about the future and what this can look like? You know, are you seeing positive movement on the ground? I do feel like there is a slight. Or even, I think there's a strong corporate, like at the top narrative shift um, about empowering black women and empowering communities, um, communities of color and marginalized communities. But I don't, I'm not extremely confident that, that that's not a, sadly like a fad if or, or like whatever they're doing for their profits right now. I, mean, you know, I think that might be fickle. Um, I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not sure. What, what, is, is, it, what is exciting you? Where's that going? Um, you know, what does the future look like in your eyes that's, op- that's optimistic? Yeah, I mean, I I kind of agree with you. Um, you know, this could be seen as a as a fad um, right now. I mean, we tend to have short attention spans. It's like, you know, and so it could be another issue two years from now. But I, I think, you know, I, I do think this kind of push on infrastructure um, and and broadening that notion of infrastructure. Um, and the fact that there's, you know, support for that and, you know, public support for that is, is exciting um, because it, it means that we can really uh, reimagine systems that have been in decay, have been neglected, and, and also think about, about issues in tandem, right? To think about jobs and climate change, right? To think about, you know, racial injustice and, and, and our labor market, you know. So I'm excited about the conversations that are taking place there. I think there is, you know, a big push to understand what this this pandemic has meant to our economy. I think there's some exciting research happening to to really to really tell us things that we're not going to see in our data for a couple of years, and that we're not going to see it all, right? Um, and I think for us, we want to really get down and 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 talk to folks in communities to understand what's happened and what's really needed. And so I think that there's a great deal of interest there to actually, you know, we're actually trying to solve for certain problems. I mean, I think even with the GI pilots, we are trying to solve for issues around poverty or or homelessness um, and and, and bigger issues like that. I think there's a lot more um, appetite for talking about structural change in ways I haven't seen in many years. So that's kind of exciting. I think we've just got to, we've got to like, we've got to push, we've got to push like hell right now because, you know, this is, this is, um, we're talking about, you know, generations to come and how they'll be impacted by the decisions that we make today when we're seeing 
um, you know, such inequality that continues to widen and widen and widen. And, you know, what does this mean for future generations if we don't tackle some of these issues? What will it mean if we don't begin to tackle climate change, if we don't begin to think about, yeah, it's, it's, it is a disaster. And I think, you know, um, you know, this is a time where we can't, we can't be complacent. We've got to keep pushing. And I'm excited around the, about the energy that I'm seeing, even in communities that are, are, are really thinking about local ways in which they can address this level of inequality. So that's exciting. I am excited about that. And uh, I think Andrew, Andrew said this publicly. He's like, look, whatever Joe Biden says or does, um, no matter how radical, can automatically become mainstream because of the, the kind of what their administration represents. Um, and I do, they, the broadening of the definition of infrastructure is so fascinating to me because there was a big um, movement on the left to say gender equality is infrastructure and XYZ is infrastructure. And on the face of it, you know, if you're like, if you're stuck in the old box, you're like, wait a second, infrastructure is like roads and streets. So like, it's not. But on the other hand, you're like, wait a second, like if we're talking about infrastructure in terms of like how this country is set up and how people operate, how people are able to operate for success within it, then of course it is. Right. Like then. So that is what I think is um, I hope is, is exciting. Um, and the answer I'll leave it like this, like Andrew and I were talking, it's like, look, the answer for those with with means, if you will, and means can be anything, not just dollars, with family, like a stable families and, and opportunities and the ability to be mobile in this and participate in this economy. Your choice is to keep your money and go into a bunker, right? Or, to, you know, like hide um, and just be like, and turn a blind eye, like whatever you want to call it, or do something or go fight. And I, what I appreciate about you and your work and what you're doing is that you're fighting you're, every day. It's a fight. Um, it doesn't always feel like one. Sometimes it feels like paperwork, but it, it's a fight. Um, so um, thank you from the bottom of my heart um, for one, teaching me, but two, two doing what you're doing. Um, and where can the Yang Gang and anyone listening to this, where can they find you and, and your work um, and how can they help? You can find us at uh, insightcced.org. Um, you know, um, we love donations, but we also just want people to be engaged with us in this work. Those that are interested in, in shifting narratives, those that are really interested in um, thinking about how um, we need to look at our labor market coming out of this pandemic and, and, and think about those who have been crowded into the, the most dangerous jobs and those that are, are really, um, you know, uh, really seeing that their income can't keep up with the cost of living. Um, those types of issues, if you're really excited about those, love for you to, to, to join us in, in the work that we do. Uh, we will put the link in, um, you know, in, in the description of this episode. But I will say this, look, if you, if you know a great, um, of course, a nonprofit and, and, and much needed, but also I think um, when I was combing through your work and there's a lot of research and just thought provoking pieces you guys have there. So sharing stuff like that and talk, and not only just on social media, but also in your daily lives and when you talk about it. And then that's where the, the real start change and narrative change start happening. So Anne Price, thank you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for being awesome. Thank you for fighting. And I look forward to um, talking to you soon. Thank you, Zach. Take care.